this is May 15th, 1987. This is Joe Todd and Bernice Jackson and interview with Mr. Troy Leon Cole in Moreland, Oklahoma. Mr. Cole, where were you born? In Nimsy, New Mexico. And when's your birthday? October the 19th, 1926. Who is your father? Price Gorm Cole, G-O-R-N. And your mother? Mary Olsa Williams Cole. Yeah, her main name is Williams? Yeah. Where were your parents from? Well, my dad was born here in Oklahoma in 1907, August the 7th. And my mother was born in Loop, Texas, February the 15th, in 1909. Did you know your grandparents? Yeah. Were either one of your grandfathers in the Civil War? I had a great grandpa, two great grandpas in the Civil War. One named Elder and one named Morrison. Well, I mean Morse. What were the first names? Uh, grandpa Morse named the Sam, but I don't know my Grandpa Elder's first name. What side were they on? They were Southerners. <laughs> Ever hear any stories about them? No, very little, except Grandpa Morris lost a leg in the Civil War, and Mama said when she was just a little girl, Grandpa said my toes were itching, and they'd scratch that stub because his toes still felt like he had them, even though he didn't have a leg left. And it scratched his toes. Mm -hmm. And what were your grandparents' names? Well, my mother's dad was named Charles Lane Williams, and her mother was named Pamela Elizabeth Elder. She, Grandma Williams, my mother's mother, was born in Pickett County, Tennessee, where Cordell Hull lived. And Grandpa Williams was born in Van, Van Buren, Arkansas, 110 years ago this fall. What about your father's parents? My father's mother was born here in Oklahoma in Indian Territory, and his grandma was born here too. Yeah. Were they Indian? Pardon me, they were in Cherokee Territory, Delaware County. They got kicked out, of, well, they didn't exactly get kicked out of Georgia. They decided that they were going to have to leave. Grandma was married to a white man named Paul, P-O-L-L-E, and, and they went to Texas because they could get 4,000 acres of land. That was before Texas became a state. And then they took up the land, and when Texas became a state, they told Grandma and Grandpa they didn't want them there, and so they went to Gravit, Arkansas. And then from Arkansas to, to uh, Oklahoma, and when my Great great grandpa died. He owned three banks, one in Southwest City, Missouri, and I can't remember where the other two were. But one of my uncles just died a few years ago. He was 103, I think. And they had a piece of the paper about it, and the cousin sent it to me. Hmm. I can't find it now. <laughs> uh, now, did they go to Texas when it was Republic? They went to Texas when it was part of Mexico. See, the Mexican government would give you. 2,000 acres, something like that, if you wanted to farm, or 4,000, something if you wanted to ranch. They went down there. They were pretty well hooked in Georgia, but they decided to be smart to move, and they moved to Texas. What part of Texas? I don't really know, but if I could talk to my aunt up there, and I could tell you. <laughs> Where she lives? She lives in Jay, Oklahoma. What's her name? Her name is Meadows. M E A D. It's like any, like that Meadows sport goods. It's got a W in it. M-E-A-D-O-W-S? I think like so, yeah. yeah. She lives in J? J. What's her first name? Viola. Viola. She's an aunt, but married, but she knows all about that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when they left Texas, they came to Indian Territory then? To grab it. See, to grab it. The party so, is yeah. in part of it. All that was Cherokee territory in there then, mm -hmm. and then they finally moved over into Oklahoma. And what was your grandfather's name on your father's side? George Etna Cole, born in Albany, New York. I don't know what year. I remember when he died because he died in 1936. Mm -hmm. He died just a little while before my father died. 
And what kind of work did your father do? He was a mechanic for Sinclair. And then 1934, they had a big strike. They fired everybody. He worked for Sinclair, and they fired everybody, even from the janitor form up to the vice president. And they figured, well, they never would get back, and he had bought a farm, so we moved to the farm at Silasaw down in eastern Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, why did your parents move to New Mexico? Well, my mother was born in Texas in 1909, and her folks went over there and took up land in New Mexico, homesteaded. And I don't know why Grandpa left Oklahoma. He was in the well drilling business, and he just pulled up stakes and went to New Mexico. Grandpa Cole did. And never did drill any more wells. He stayed there a while, and it's dry, you know, you couldn't raise nothing, and he moved from there plumbing down to Arkansas, where there's plenty of water, but you couldn't sell. <laughs> uh, what part of New Mexico? In Roosevelt County. And uh, what part of New Mexico is that? It's, you know what Portales is. Yeah. Well, see, that's the county seat of okay. Roosevelt County. I was okay. born in Roosevelt County. And how long did you stay in New Mexico? Well, stayed there till 1929, and then we moved to Seminole. That's where Daddy went to work for Sinclair. And we stayed in Seminole till 34, when they had the strike. We went to the farm, and he died on the farm on 37, February 22nd. Do you remember Seminole as being a boom town? Oh, yeah. Tell me about that. <laughs> They was drilling wells all over the place, and that was during Prohibition. They was drilling wells and making homebrew and whatever. And there's a lot of killing and fighting and raising cane going on. I've got a cousin that used to be ag teacher at Sealand. Him and some boys after we left there went over across the creek and was digging a hole to make them a cave, and they dug up a skeleton. A few years before that, when we were still living, the Seminole they found a car with blood mess up, you know, but they never did find anybody, and these kids dug up the body. Well, they, <laughs> they dug up the skull, and that's far as they ever got. But Buck can tell you a lot about Seminole. See, he lived there and went till he was grown, and then he went to college in Stillwater. Mm -hmm. and he was in the medical service in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, now, a Seminole, was it maybe a tent city in those days? Or? No, 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 that was before we moved before. there. But around Seminole area, where they was doing a lot of drilling, there was a lot of tents put up. We lived in a blue stucco house in 1930 when my brother was born. And then we moved out of it into another house. There's a section of Seminole I've heard referred to as Hell's Half Acre. <laughs> I don't know anything about that, but on 8th Street, we used to have an old boy deliver the papers when I was a kid, and he had a stripped down car, and he'd come down the street 60 miles an hour because the kids were throwing rocks across the street at each other, and it's dangerous to drive a car down 8th Street. That's 19, in the 30s, early 30s. Have you heard of Hell's Half Acre? Well, you can pretty much imagine why <laughs> from the name. See, this, uh, this neighborhood we lived in was fairly quiet. <laughs> this little rock throwing going on. Yeah, well, Hell's Half Acre was a red light district, and that's yeah. where all the, the saloons and the killings and everything went yeah. on. Um, when did they bring in that Seminole oil field? Do you know? I don't really know. It was back in the 20s, though. So. Mm -hmm. Now, what caused the strike in 34? They wanted more money. At that time, my dad was working for Sinclair, and he specialized in Mack trucks, and he was making $80 a week, which was a lot of money in those days. But they decided that, that wasn't enough, so they went on strike. And that took in the truck drivers, engineers, and everything else, and they just, the company just fired them all. And that strike lasted six weeks. But they didn't think they'd ever harm them back. He was a union man, and we moved to Silasaw on the farm. He had bought while we were living there. Mm -hmm. And he, he is a, a good farmer, but he is used to a check coming in, you know, and that just killed him. And he, in February, or January in 1937, he went to Seminole to work for Uncle Pop. 
and for who? Uncle Punk. They called him Punk because went to steal watermelons and somebody shot at him and the next morning he went back to get his knife and they're sticking in a pumpkin. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Punk had a gas station, service station, Exide battery outfit there and Daddy went up there and worked. I got two letters that Daddy wrote. One of them was dated but the other one he didn't date just before he died. And my brother got sick and he came home and he walked six miles from town out to Salisaw, out to where we live. And he got pneumonia and died. And if you had a little penicillin, you could probably save him. But... Did you meet Mr. Sinclair? Sinclair, no. Mm -hmm. If I did, I never did know it. Yeah, thank you. He lived I, in Tulsa. I used to go over there and hang around the garage so when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But I how old were you when you moved to Salisaw? Eight. What chores did you do in the farm over there? Just slop the hogs and cut wood and carry water. We had a big garden, about an acre and a half, and there's no pump or nothing like that. So every morning and every evening, us kids carried water from the creek to put it on the garden. Daddy made beds about four feet wide, and you never stepped on the beds. And we raised nearly everything we eat. We burned wood and had cold oil lights, no ice box, no refrigerator. What kind of house did you have? Just a two-room boxboard house in the cellar and the barn. We had a dug well and then we had a spring, a good spring, real good water. And the creek run right through the place. Chicken house. Had a couple of horses and farmed with horses. Did many people from around Salisaw go to California in the 30s? Not that I know of. That old boy that wrote that book, the just picked the town. Because Joe Jones showed came them from dust, Salisaw. Showed them dust storms and everything. And we did not have dust on. We had dust settle there, but we got 40 inches of rain a year. Mm -hmm. and there was no dust storms. Only dust we got was just something that settled off out here. <laughs> you know, I found out they talked about all the Okies that went to California. Yeah. More of them went east and went west. Well, because they, they came here and yeah. settled and they went back home to Georgia and yeah. Alabama and all A that. lot of them that went west stayed out there during World War II if you was trying to catch a ride, hitchhiking. It was impossible unless they were from Oklahoma or Texas, you know. Anytime you got a ride, you could just almost figure smoke the home, especially when it started talking. Mm -hmm. And they'd pick you up and take you where you was going. Mm -hmm. um, how long did you stay on the farm in South Salt? Till Daddy died. Um, he died in February, and we moved to Texas in May in 1937. What part of Texas? Herford, Texas. Right out on the flat. There was no trees, no green grass. That was the awfulest looking place I ever saw in my life. And it was dry then, see. That was in the 30s. Dusty, dirty. Of course, it was tapering off a little. They started irrigating around there and it got better. Why'd you move to Texas? Because mother's dad and sisters lived there at Herford. Mm -hmm. I would never moved if I had anything to do with it myself. But she figured she'd be better off out there. And I went to work in 1937 washing dishes in the cafe. And when I was 12, I started cooking because I could make $8 a week cooking. What was your specialty? Cooking? I can cook anything. I, I bake and decorate cakes now. I'm retired. But I bake and decorate cakes. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. Salads and just anything. You can ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to get some more information on Seminole, yeah. your memories of that, because when it was a boom town, just incidents that you remember what happened, like what were the main well, cause I of the shootings? I remember an oil well far when I was a kid. I can't remember one of that 32 or 33 over close to Weewoken. You could see it from Seminole. And we drove over there, Daddy had a car, and we drove over there. And over there and they wouldn't let you get within a mile and a half of the dang thing, but you could feel the heat a mile and a half away. And they were trying to put the bell out. What caused the shootings in Seminole? Same as everywhere else. Just idiots, I think, caused the shooting. Like drunk or? Drunk, and this and that, and gambling, just like it is anywhere. Today, well, it's worse today. You hear more about it. You didn't hear as much about it. We had a 
policeman friend that lived right across the street named Butch LaCroix, and he did not have a car. And whenever the Indians had a stomp dance, Daddy always took him to stomp dance and the barbecue buffalo. And we'd all go and watch the Indians dance. Of course, Daddy was part of Indian too. And we'd go watch the Indians dance. The law went along because some of the Indians drank a little far away. <laughs> so you're part Cherokee? Part Cherokee. You have your little cart, CDIP? I ain't got enough Cherokee even to get one. I need the roll number. Yeah, I know. I'm going to go down there at Muskogee someday, or down there where they got the rolls, you know. Oh, Oklahoma City. They got them in Oklahoma City. Yeah. See, Grandma was, my great great grandma was a full blood Cherokee. Mm -hmm. And this cousin of mine down here at, uh, at, uh, Ceiling, Sutton, one of his grandpas way back there in 1760, they traced the family tree back that far on his side of the house, and his grandpa was a Cherokee Indian. There's the, the main archivist, Mary Lee yeah. Boyle. She has all the yeah. roles and everything. That's like over there in New Mexico, they used to keep all the birth records in the county seat, and I sent my birth certificate in right after World War II to get a terminal leave bond. Mm -hmm. And they never got it back, so I had to get a new one, and they had transferred everything to the state capital. I sent money to the state capital. sent too much money, and never did get my birth certificate, and finally called them. They said, yeah, I said, we got the check all right, and they figured somebody cashed the check and took the extra money and paid for the birth certificate, but they never did send the birth certificate. And two days after I called them, and I had one. It's in Spanish and English. Uh -huh. um, when did you start school? 19 and, I think it was 1931 in the primary. I was five years old when I started. Is that Seminole? Yeah. How big was the Seminole school? Well, as I recall, it wasn't too big. This is a grade school. And they had high school and they had a junior college even then. Thirties, and I went to school there part of that year, I guess all that year, and then the next year I moved out on a lease south of Seminole, out there where Sinclair did all their work on the trucks and stuff, and I went to school called Taylor. It's gone now. I went down to look here a few years ago. The school has gone. The school has gone where I started school even. It's not there anymore. What uh, what were the kids like that were, you know, kids do all through the workers in Seminole? What kind of kids were they? Well, just <laughs> about like all field worker kids now. <laughs> and you went through high school? No. No, and uh, I went, last year I went to school, I went to New Mexico, went out there at my uncle's and stayed in New Mexico on the farm and ranch. And, I quit in the middle of the ninth grade. I got me a job making two dollars a day, and I didn't think I'd ever make it. <laughs> of course, when I quit the railroad, I was making thirteen dollars and forty-four cents an hour when I retired. What kind of job did you have when you quit high school? I went went to cooking, working in the bakery and, and in the kitchens. There in New Mexico? No, in Texas. I went back to Texas. Hereford. Hereford. Yeah. And you entered the service in Hereford. Yeah. Well, I. I volunteered at Amarillo, and then they shipped me down to Lubbock for me. And when did you volunteer? December 1943. I went to boot camp in San Diego for five weeks, and then I went to Cook and Baker School for three months. I didn't need to, but they sent me anyway. And then I went to submarine school. I volunteered for submarine service. Tell me about boot camp in San Diego. Well, there's not much to tell. They get you up early in the morning and give you calisthenics and give you five minutes to change clothes and go eat and then run you a mile or two of them and they teach you how to tie knots and just like it is now, only now it takes three months instead of five weeks. Was it a rush program because the war was going on? Yeah, everything was rushed. A lot of them old boys were in boot camp with me as soon as they got out of boot camp in five weeks, they were put on a ship. They didn't know the front end of the ship from the back end. And I went to cook and baker school 
the end of what submarine school, and I learned a little bit more. On submarine school, you have to, they give you a book about this thick and about that big. And you have to draw every nut and bolt and washer in that submarine on paper. So you know where everything's at. I was a baker on the submarine after I got on the big one. And you had a valve overhead. Whenever they hollered, dive, dive, it closed hydraulically. But you had a handle to turn to make sure it closed. And then whenever they surfaced, you had to turn it back the other way, even though you could see that dial going around and you knew it was open, you still had to turn that just to make sure the dial wasn't malfunctioning or something. Uh, that did you volunteer for submarine service? Yeah. I figured if you couldn't see the bullets, you wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> How does the service in a submarine differ from a regular ship? Well, they're small, compact, this 300, and this and I was almost 310 feet long. Was, and 1,500 ton water displacement. What was the name of it? USS Razorback. It's in the Turkey Navy now. They sold it or leased it or whatever to Turkey. And Turkey has it now. Mm -hmm. And it's built in New London, Connecticut. It's electric boat company there. What I year was it built? Uh, built in 1943. No, no, let's see. I got on it. Yeah, it was built in 43. And they had a shakedown cruise off the coast of the United States on the East Coast. They took a bunch of newspaper reporters with them and they got tangled up in the nets. They got sub had submarine nets and they had little mishaps, two or three little mishaps. And they thought, well, the boat, boat's jinxed. The submarines, or sailors, are superstitious. And when come in there, I was at Midway Island waiting for a submarine on a submarine tender. And when they come in there, they had a baker that was something wrong with him, sick or something, and they had to have a baker. And another guy was supposed to go in, but he, he gave up his submarine service because he heard the boat was jinxed and he would not go aboard it. So I got to go instead. And rode around out there about 76,000 miles, running around in circles, and sank a few ships in the guff of the lady. We have to sink 12 there one day, and there's a big troop transport. We were on one side and another submarine on the other side, and both of us fired tor six torpedoes at the same time, and 10 of them hit, but two of them didn't. One of ours didn't hit that ship, and one of theirs didn't hit it. And from the time the torpedoes hit that ship till it went out of sight, sank, completely sank, it was 30 seconds. They just cut the bottom off and it, whoosh. They was watching and the captain sent a message to that other submarine and said, what in the world are you trying to do, sink us? And he said, that's what I was going to ask you. He said, one of your torpedoes missed. And they, actually, you could sink each other. They just, they missed. And they estimated we killed 35,000 Japanese troops there just in a few minutes in the Gulf of Lady. Then, We'd already run out of torpedoes. We was at battle stations 18 hours, and uh, they started dropping depth charges. They had two escorts that we didn't get because they was fast. They moved around too fast. And the captain just told us to rig for silent running, and we'd sit on the bottom. It's supposed to be about 125 or 30 feet of water there in that guff of the lady. And we got in a hole. And when we got down to 685 feet, that's where we stopped. And well, they they checked the submarine out when we got back to in because they wanted to make sure that everything was working right, and it was. We went down 685 feet, and you've heard people push on the bottom of a burp, uh, surf bucket and had a ping. That's the way that two-inch steel was a ping. And, and I was sitting there in the mess hall, and the uh, yeoman come back and said, how, how deep do you think we are back shop? And I said, I don't have any idea. He said, come look at the depth gauge. And I walked up to the control room and looked at the depth gauge, and it's 685 feet. And there's lots of pressure on the boat when you get that deep underwater. After the destroyer escorts got through dropping all their depth charges, there's 385 of them, I counted them. And after they got through dropping them, then we surfaced, and the captain felt so good 
we chased them. We actually chased them and destroyed our escorts, and while we were chasing them, they gave us orders to go up close to Tokyo and pick up B-29 survivors. Some of them got shot up, you know, and land in the ocean. But before we took off, they said, everybody needs a drink. And they give everybody an eight-ounce bottle of brandy and an eight-ounce glass full of whiskey. Most time, the whole crew had been drunk, but nobody got drunk. Not a solitary soul. And some of them old boys wasn't used to drinking anything, but they give each one of them 16 ounces of booze. And we took off, and we chased it. Nobody wanted to catch him but the captain. <laughs> but while we were chasing, they said, we got a message. Everything come in coded. It looked kind of like a typewriter, see? Like a teletype. But it come in just scrambled up, just a bunch of letters on a piece of paper. And then you typed it back through this typewriter, and it come out in plain English. This boat had a reputation of being jinxed, and we had a little bald-headed radio man. And when we got back to Guam, after we'd been on this war cruise, we found out who he was. He was one of them government men checking up, see what in the world was wrong with that submarine. He said there was nothing wrong with it. It's just little goof ups, you know. But we found out after he left that he was a, one of them G2 men or whatever you call them, and trying to find out what there was nothing wrong with the submarine. And there was a crew neither. Could you get a reputation of being jinxed? <laughs> Uh, what were your normal duties on the submarine? Your I was a baker. Average day. I was a baker. I worked at night and I baked bread. I baked 36 two pound loaves of bread every night and I had a box about two foot square and I'd fill that full of sugar cookies. Them old boys on the submarine changed shifts every four hours whenever they come off there grazing and drinking coffee. The coffee pot was continuing to be in operation and I'd bake the bread every night and then I'd bake pies and cookies and donuts. When we when they picked me up there at Midway, they couldn't get a regular donut cutter, you know, about that big. So one of them old boys made one as big as a saucer, about six inches. And you could only fry six donuts at a time. And they called them balloon tars, but I made a bit. <laughs> Well, when you were down six hundred and eighty five feet, was that when you stayed there for two hundred days? Were you under seas for 200 days? Hmm. No, no. You're no. thinking about somebody else now. That Stein boy was, they got a Stein boy here, was on one of them nuclear submarines, and they could stay under the water for two or three hours. But the one I was on, ordinarily we didn't stay under water, but eight or ten hours, see. Oh. We didn't have any way of purifying the air. And when we stayed under that 18 hours, they poured out some white stuff, I can't remember what to call it now, on the sheets, and it took the bad stuff out of there and it turned black, just as black as coal. Mm. Um, well, the submarine I was on had been under 200 days. I wouldn't have been here today. When, um, where did you get on a submarine? Got on a submarine, submarine at Midway Island. I had my 18th birthday at Midway Island in 1944. Did that's the Battle of Midway? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't have been there probably. <laughs> yeah, it's after the Battle of Midway. Mm -hmm. There's about a thousand acres of white sand there and a few palm trees and salt cedar. That's all it is. And thousands of soldiers and sailors in. What was your first maneuver on the submarine on the Razorback? We, they come in there, when the submarine comes into a submarine tender, they always check everything, every nut, bolt, and washer. And then they take them out for a trial cruise, you know, and then back in. And, and we left there and we headed for the Philippine Seas, and we got low on fuel, and we went at Saipan when they were still fighting at Saipan, and you could hear the guns up in the hills, and we were there tied up to the submarine tender and refueled, and got more food, and took off again, but the day we landed there at Saipan, you read in the Bible where the water in the rivers turned to blood. They had a creek there, and it was running blood red. They killed 9,000 Japanese troops up in the hills, and it's raining, and the water was running just as red as blood you'd find at the hospital. That's Did the Americans lose any men there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everywhere we went, they lost men. Um, 
What was the date when you got on the Razorback? I don't know. It's is in October, right? Shortly after my birthday, but so I can't 43. remember. Forty-three. Forty-four. Forty-four. Yeah. yeah. And when was the Battle of Lake Gulf? It was in November, December, in forty-four. Gulf of Lady. I had a friend and was in the army, and I was talking about it one day, telling about we sank all them Japanese ships, and there were no survivors. They floated up on the beach there, and I said, I sure hate to bend while them Marines, all them bodies floating up there in hot, you know, in the Philippines. And he said, well, I'll tell you one thing, the Marines wasn't there, said the Army was there, and said we were backed right up against the beach and said we couldn't stand the smell, and they fought their way out. They had been pinned down, and they fought their way out of there. They took bulldozers and buried them. Um, now, were you anywhere in the area of Truck or Taro? Yeah, I've been to I've been to 27 different islands: Ulithia and Masayan, Truck and Tarawa. Are you at the battles there? No, Tarawa. No, uh, them submarines they get around quite a bit in submarine tenders. And mm -hmm. The battles were all all over. See, after I got off the submarine, I went back to I went to Guam and got on another submarine tender. That's where they launched the invasion of Iwo Jima. I had a friend, his brother was in the Marines, and he went from there to Iwo Jima. And, and then they went on to Okinawa. Worst scare I ever got on that submarine was, I didn't have any reason to be scared, but I, we were in a real rough sea, and we had an officer named Patilio from uh, Yokum, Texas, Spaniard. Mm -hmm. And he was running about 90 feet underwater, and the sea was rough, and I was asleep. It's daytime. I worked at night and slept in the daytime as a baker. And the little electric stove turned over on an old boy's foot, and he hollered, and whenever I jumped out of bed, the submarine was headed up like that, about to broach. And I said, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die in bed. And I crawled back in bed, and it finally leveled off, and we went down lower in the water. And that night I seen Ensign Patilio. I said, next time we're in rough sea, I said, keep her down. He said, you ain't gonna have to tell me twice. <laughs> the officer had come back to the kitchen and drank coffee just like the enlisted men. Mm -hmm. I had one officer named Adams and come back and gripe and grunt and groan, you know, and, and that, if he didn't want anything, if they wanted something, well, he'd real nice then. But he told me about one time he worked in a bakery, you know, I really believed him. It sounds serious. And finally he told me he was a janitor. But he's a judge now. And one of the cooks I was cooked with... Thank you. This is interesting. One of the cooks I cooked with runs a Holiday Inn in Bossier City, Louisiana. And his name's Dement. And in the Russian Olympics, he had a boy that was a boxer, mm -hmm. and I seen that kid on TV, and I said, well, that sounds like a cook that I used to know. And come to find out it's his son. He won a gold medal boxing, just a little bitty guy, you know. Oh, yeah. They had them little bitty boxers, too. Mm -hmm. Another cook we had named Miller, he lives in New Jersey. I hear from him once in a while, and I taught him how to bake. He didn't know anything about bed, or baking bread, but sometimes he'd help me, and I taught him how to bake bread. And he runs a big baking company now. Hmm. Another cook on there, I can't even remember his name, this big fat guy, older man. And he runs a food service for a big chain of old people's homes. Anyone that you served with on the Razorback lives here in Oklahoma? Not that I know of. Now this old boy down there at the ceiling works in the, got a liquor store. He was on the Razorback, but it was after the war was over. I, don't, I can't even remember his name. Did when you were going to Leyte Gulf, mm -hmm. did you know that you were going to hit the Japanese fleet? No, oh, you just sat out there where they told you to and waited until something come along. When of you course, they knew the Japanese would be trying to reinforce the troops, mm -hmm. and at that time it didn't work. When you first realized the Japanese fleet was coming, what was your reaction? They just sat there and waited. There's three submarines there. We sank 12 ships in just a few minutes. 
all of them except them escorts, and them was the ones that the ladies came. How long did the battle last? Well, we were at battle stations 18 hours. From the time they rang the gong until we were come back up to the surface, it was 18 hours. At 18 hours, what did you do in 18 hours at your battle station? <laughs> I sat in the kitchen with a sack full of wooden plugs in case we got a hole. And that's what I was supposed to do, is drive them plugs in them holes to stop the water from coming in. But we were lucky we didn't even crack a seam. Busted a few gauges in the engine room. But I had been on the battle phones whenever you passed out ammunition. Of course, didn't use a deck gun much. But we were there at Midway Island, and they hollered battle station, deck gun action. They called down to the where we kept the bullets, right below the kitchen, and five inch shells and said he wanted eight rounds of some special ammunition. I didn't just send anything, and I answered him. And he repeated the order, and I answered him. And he repeated it about three or four times, and I answered him every time, but the radio or telephone wasn't working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the last time it was. <laughs> I could see the yeoman see through the door, in the, and I give him a good dressing down. And they took me off of them phones because <laughs> you're not supposed to talk to an officer that way. He asked me who I, if I knew who I was talking to, and I actually thought I was talking to the yeoman because the yeoman was a mouth, you see. It's like he was talking. And I thought I was talking to him, but I was talking to Mr. Hurst. <laughs> they took me off the battle phone and gave me that sack full of wood and blood. <laughs> what were your sleeping quarters in the submarine? Well, we, sat, we had... Um, bunks about this wide and they were where I slept there were four high there's two guys above me and one guy below me and when the guy on top got in bed he's a big guy I couldn't he was a pharmacist mate a chief petty officer he stayed back with the enlisted men he didn't stay in the chief's quarter he stayed in our quarter and when he got in bed I'd have to wake him up to get out of bed because he'd pushed the bed down that much you're talking about uh, colored people see now we had colored men on the submarine and good old boys and we had a safety meeting on the railroad and the boss said would it bother you to sit next to a colored man and I said no I slept between two of them on that submarine the first one I went on went to school on is one each pipe there's three bunks one two three right side by side and you had to get in the middle I slept in the middle and the colored man on either side of him I said it don't bother me to eat with him I said I slept with two of them <laughs> How many crew members on the Razorback? Ninety-seven. Ninety-seven. Boy, you talk about a bunch that eat, they really eat. There wouldn't be any bread left the next night. It's the same old thing every night. Seventy-two pounds of light bread. And Where did you, how often did you have to get supplies? We took off from Midway Island and we didn't get any more food for 105 days. We took enough with us. You'd be surprised how much stuff you can stick in the submarine. But rations were getting a little short. And one night, I was baking bread. Old kid come down and said, give me a piece of steak. And I said, what do you want a piece of steak for? He said, oh, I'm going to give it to a goonie bird or an albatross. They claim if an albatross lands on your ship, it's good luck, see. And I said, well, I'm not giving you any steak. I said, we'll be lucky if we have enough to get back to Guam. A little bit here comes the chief of the boat, named Fort. And he said, cut me a piece of steak. I said, no, sir, I'm not giving you any steak. He said, well, I'll cut it myself. I said, you may, but I said, I ain't giving you any or cutting any steak for any bird. But see, the sailors are superstitious and believe a lot of junk. Of course, that albatross didn't have anything to do with us getting back safe, even though he did land, he landed on them. They took that steak up there and fed it to them, too. Mm -hmm. Albatross, they call them goonie birds. They breed there at Midway Island. They got wings a oh, longer than that. When they come in, when they hit the ground, they just roll like a ball. They can't land very good, but when they get up in the air, they can really fly. Mm -hmm. Was the uh, Battle of Leyte Gulf, was that the only major battle you were yeah. in? Yeah. That's the only. Tell me about going up to uh, Japan, picking up the survivors. Well, we went up there and, and uh, run around until we found uh, and then the little rubber rafts, you know, 
boss, some of them old boys was glad to see the submarine show up just tickle to death. They'd give you the shirt off their back for a souvenir, but there's some of them just been in the water an hour or two. <laughs> Wasn't that way. They picked up a bunch of 18 or 19 survivors, B-29, and one day they seen a little old bitty sailboat, see, a sandpan they call it. And they thought, well, we just sink that thing, it's a Japanese flag on it, and they surfaced to shoot the thing out of the water. Well, it did shoot it out of the water. But that thing had everything from a machine gun to a five-inch cannon on it. It's a little old sailboat. And picked up a few survivors. Had one guy burnt real bad. And one Japanese burnt real bad. And uh, hadn't moved. Just lay there in the bed several days. And the cook had French fries for supper. And turned to fry later on. But something went wrong, it didn't go off, and the first thing you know, there's black smoke running from one end of that submarine to the other. And that Jap got out of bed then. He'd been faking. He'd been, he was burnt all right, but you know, he claimed he couldn't move. And he got up that day, though. What did he do? He got out of bed and wanted to get out of there. And there ain't no place to go when you're underwater. <laughs> I think it, yeah, I know it's in the daytime because I was asleep. I always slept in the daytime and worked at night. We were out there waiting around, you know, for Japanese ships to show up. And I'd get my bread ready, and it'd just get rising up there real pretty. And about 9.30 or 9.40 every night, the Japanese plane would fly over, and they'd dive, and they'd put pressure in the boat, and they'd just shove that bread back down, you know. It'd gradually come back under pressure, and made the prettiest bread you ever saw. It had real fine grain. But it happened every night, all, every day, seven days a week. I did all the baking, see, and it happened every night about the same time. Mm -hmm. but it, it actually helped the bread because it come back up under that pressure and it made the grain real fine, real good bread. Hmm. What did you do in VJ Day? In VJ Day I was there at Guam and I hadn't been over on Guam for quite a while and I got took a bath and put on clean clothes, and I said, I'll just go for a walk. They'd been pumping mud out of the bay and pick up seashells. And I was walking along on that good, flat, dry surface, and I sank plumb to my waist in that gray, greasy-looking mud. Crawled out and went back to the ship and took a bath and went to bed. <laughs> that night, though, they woke me up. They were shooting fireworks, pyrotechnic shells, you know. Ain't no telling. They probably shot up a million or two dollars worth of shells. They make pretty colored green, yellow, and orange, and all different colors. And they set a destroyer on fire. One of them landed on the destroyer. It had phosphorus in it, see. The destroyer had wooden decks. A lot of them had, still had wooden decks and caught the deck on fire. But there's a happy bunch of old boys. We listened to the radio for three days, wait for the war to be over, from the 11th to the 14th. Had that radio on going. And most time, most of us were up listening. We knew it was going to be over. But it took off the bomb, you know, the bomb. Yeah, tell me about that, your reaction to the bomb. I think they should have used it sooner, but they didn't have it ready any sooner, I don't think. And when did you get your discharge? March the 6th, 1946, San Pedro. And you returned to Morgan? No, I, re I, I went from Texas in the Navy. I didn't live here then. But I come back to Herbert, Texas, and went to work in the bakery. And then I went down and worked on a ranch a little while, and then I messed around and got married. <laughs> and went, went to work on a railroad. I worked a little over 30 years. Which railroad? Santa Fe, this one right here. I lived right here and worked. What was your wife's name? Vera. What was her name? Rettman. R-E-D-T-M-A-N-N. Means horse handler. I got a sister-in-law. When she was young, she had her fortune told, and they told her she was going to marry a man that handled horses, see. And when she got married, she found out her husband's name means horse butler. That's what it means. Hmm. Rhett butler. Or, I mean horse butler. Rhettman means horse butler. Mm -hmm. So her fortune turned out right, but she didn't get married until she was 49 years old. <laughs> and how come you moved to Morgan? Well, I bid this job in. You bid on jobs on the railroad, and this, I had a chance to get one there in Texas, 
let somebody out bid me and this one come up. I had well, I had another chance in Texas, but I didn't want to get down there to around Lubbock and all that sand. That boy, that dirt just killed my sinus. I had sinus trouble until I moved up here. Mm -hmm. We what? moved here in '67. I mean '65. What job did you do with the railroad? What I was signal maintainer. And what, what does he do? He takes care of all them red lights and signals that the railroad operated and switch machines and pole line. You're a plumber, a painter, an electrician, and jack of all trades in the signal department. You have to study electronics. How are the railroads doing these days? Are they? Well, I don't know. They, of course, they always cry and have some. But uh, the Santa Fe, even in the 30s, is the only railroad, Class A railroad, that paid a dividend all through the Depression. It's the only railroad in this country that paid a dividend. But they're trying to close trying to get where they don't even have to stop in Woodward now. Don't like that too much. But they ain't got it done. That's that's what they'd like to do. Yeah. How many kids you have? Five. Five. Where's the name? John Charles, Patricia Sue, Larry Dean, Leon Price, and Angela Marie. Got eight grandkids. <laughs> Seven grandsons, one granddaughter. You're questions? short on granddaughters then, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> and I'd like to go to Arkansas and see that. <laughs> I'm in Arkansas. Um, you weren't here then in the dirt storm days. I was down in eastern Oklahoma then, see. Yes. The Santa Fe. Yes. Yeah, we'd see them old black clouds coming, you know, and we mm -hmm. knew the dust was going to blow. Down well, there. we uh, read the paper where this dust went clear to the Atlantic oh, Ocean. Oh, yeah. It, it, I'm sure it did. I know in Illinois. They were talking about that old black one that come in from the north. Yes. There wasn't no dirt blowing here. That dirt come from Colorado and there wasn't even much wind. This lady I talked to the other day, she said this kind of rolling, you know, but it's this dirt settling from Colorado in this country. Since we've been married in 53, I was working in Amarillo. And I looked up north and I said, well, it looks like we've got a blue norther coming. But it wasn't. It was that old gray, black dirt like in the 30s. And it come a little shower and it stuck to everything and anything that was out in the open. It was just sticky. Just like clay. Mm -hmm. It's that gray Colorado dirt. There wasn't no dirt around here like that color. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I think you've done a good job. Yeah. I've enjoyed <laughs> this. Have yeah, you, can you think of something you've left out? Uh, when do you think we can interview your son? I'll talk to John about it. Okay. He's got a uh, business out there in the country, and he's, he's got a lifetime membership of the VFW. He's been the post commander and everything else. He married the Durer girl, Beverly Durer, She's the niece to Dr. Dewar. You know Dr. Dewar. Yes. Joe, we're trying to interview him yeah. now about the Woodward tornado. Oh, well, Joe was over there at uh, Iowa, I mean at uh, Iwo Jima. He got wounded there. Is Dr. Dewar? Yeah. He was there and they had a little break and they was eating some soup, him and a couple of other officers. And all of a sudden the shell exploded right close to him blowed him off a little cliff, and this other officer's chest was split open right down the middle, and Dr. Joe was laying by him with a broken leg, and he took safety pins, and he pinned that guy's chest together, laying there on the ground. He pinned him together, and he lived, survived the war. Well, Doc said, he fell right beside him and looked at him and said, good Lord, he said, if I don't do something fast, he's going to die. And he had a pocket full of safety pins like he pinned diapers on with. And he pinned that guy's chest together with safety pins. Just stuck them in so he didn't, there wasn't no time for any painkiller or nothing. And he survived. That's the deal with you. He could probably tell you some higher, well, he can tell you stories when he was going to medical school. He was selling papers and selling blood and him and his wife when he's going to medical school. and. He eat raw liver to build up his blood. Oh, <laughs> I like it cooked, but I don't know how in the world a guy could stand raw liver. 
but he did. Well, he's not feeling well today. Yeah. He can't hear too good anymore, but he's got a hearing aid now. Here a while back, John said, Burl had talked to him. He just ignored him, just ignored him. So one day she just reached over and got him by both ears, and she said, you old so-and-so, if you don't get a hearing aid, said, I'm going to quit talking to you at all, so I got a hearing aid. <laughs> She'd holler at him and he'd say, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you.